came to our shores when the NBL started in 1979, and boy did he make an impact. A true pioneer of our sport, Cal has made contributions on a number of levels and is a legend to Australian basketball. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, Cal Bruton. Bruton in this electrifying pace. Oh, oh yes. Yeah. Heaven's sakes, yes. look at that. Great play. Seconds to half time. The Wildcats letting down point. There's the steal from Brokey. It takes Brokey on. Comes up with wide side. To Bruton for three. This could be demoralizing. Growing up in New York City uh, is a tough environment, and sport was a tremendous, tremendous vehicle for all um, lower socioeconomic kids. Um, I always looked at it that it's the equalizer, you know, it gives you a chance. And basketball, which uh, I started late, I didn't really start playing basketball until I was a teenager. Uh, I had a little hoop in the backyard, but I found that was the sport I put the most time in once I learned to play, because all it took was a ball, a basket, and myself. And I used to be out there all the time. And then, of course, uh, I used to drive the neighbors crazy, bouncing the ball all around at all hours of the night. I lived right across the street from the gymnasium and the track. And I used to run across there, and I was so conscious of being fit. Um, I saw a lot of drugs and alcohol around my own family. So it was my thing that that can just poison you and not give you any sort of chance to get to where you want to go. But for the most part, uh, yeah, I definitely made sport my, my ticket. And I knew that was the only way that I would be able to escape that environment. But uh, Rudy Jackson was my mate, and Rudy was the sought-after player. Uh, he was uh, six foot nine, shoot the three-pointer, handle the ball, pass it, everything. And uh, Wichita, as well as about 250 other schools, was after Rudy. And Rudy decided to go to Wichita. And of course, the scout said, uh, well, you know, is there anything else we can do for you, you know? And he says, I really don't want to go without my man Cal. <laughs> and I was this point guard, you know, and I used to, you know, make sure he looked good. You know? And uh, Rudy didn't pass his classes that he needed to in order to come into Wichita State. So he had to go to junior college. And I was the one that was left. And uh, of course, the coaches were shattered, you know, because we went after this six foot nine, all American, do it all. And look what we end up with a five foot seven, you know, guy that. Geez, we can get them a dime a dozen, you know, so. And I was a little bit cocky, you know, you have a New York attitude when you grow up in that environment, you know, you believe in yourself because you had to escape it, you know, and that's the way you battle through. Well, coming out to these country bumpkins in the Midwest who thought they nicknamed me Rootin, Tootin, Calvin Bruton, you know, all that, I adjusted pretty quickly after that, you know, you, you're in university, you're getting a little bit of a rap, uh, you know, the girlies are coming to the game, you got the cheer squad, you know. I was kind of excited, actually, because you're playing in front of Wichita's fanatical fans. You get 10,000 every single game, packed. Uh, my senior year, we went on to the NCAAs, which is the big show. And our first game was against Michigan University. And after when the scouts came down and in my locker room and told me to keep my head up and pat me on the back, and my coach was real proud, but nothing could erase that dying feeling that college is over with now, you know, you're finished. I got this guy who wanted to represent me uh, from Kansas, uh, agent, said he'll, he'll get me a trial if nothing else. He ended up sending me off to San Antonio and took us on the road of exhibition season. And then I got a call like that to come to Kansas City. They heard I was in town. They remembered me from that area. My last of the week, that was over with. Now I'm really, it doesn't hit me in the face that basketball is definitely not going to be the ticket. Uh, until after Clear Blue, six months later, I got the call to come to Australia. That guy uh, who was Dr. Dave Atkins was definitely uh, not, you know, not giving up. He called me, persisted, he called me again, you know, and said, you know, this would be a great opportunity for you. It's a new league. You know, I saw you play. I think you'd be superb here. And I said, how much you pay? <laughs> I remember him saying, uh, how much you making on the trash truck? I said, 400 bucks. He said, we'll pay you that. <laughs> I thought, 400, but I can't leave the family, just make it. He said, and we'll feed you breakfast. <laughs> I said, you got a deal. And he says, well, you need to learn how to travel because you'll be doing that rather than us wait here. Just walk, look out this window. There's a little ferry that goes right across the river. Take that ferry in the river, then walk up the hill, and then you'll see the train. Go on the train. He had some coins, gave me the Australian money. He said, buy your ticket. Take the third stop. It's Auchenflower. Right from there, you'll be able to see the Auchen Dome. I thought, don't. Gee, that's all right. Yeah, I'm excited. You know, I did my shower, put my gear on, got my, my sneaks out. You know, 
you know, I'm got my little throw bag, my cap, and I always carry me a big stereo. The boys in Bristol used to remember me for carrying the, the music around. And I'm jamming all the way there and I followed the directions, got to the um, third stop on the platform looking, walking dome. Shoot, I don't see no dome. <laughs> well, it must be on the other side of that tin shed. So I head on down the step, walked toward the tin shed. I saw a basketball on the front of the stadium. I thought, huh. Heard the balls. I said, dude, it must be on the other side. Maybe this is just the facade. <laughs> I walked through and, and the cameras were there. Like, yeah, welcome to the walking dome. I said, what? He got six foot 11 up to Bruton. Bruton, the American Negro, takes the shot, puts it up and scores. After the first couple games, we lost like two out of our first three, and of course, uh, I got pulled in. Uh, Dave Atkins, who was the director of coaching, can you score? I said, well, that's not what the coaches actually do. He said, well, I, I'm telling you, you need to score. <laughs> you know, if the team is going to be successful, you need to score. And if you can't score, we might have to find somebody that can. Oh, well, you mean tell me, do I go talk to the coach? He said, just score. <laughs> first game I came out, dropped 29. And then I went and we played Wollongong, uh, Illawarra at the time. So I dropped 29 that game. We beat them by a point. Then I came back and Doc said, I think he can score more. <laughs> I was like, God. The next game I dropped 35 on Newcastle. Then I went to 40. Then I went to 44. And then I dropped 53 on Glen Elg. And now everyone, the word is out. So everywhere I went now, the teams are coming after me. Hard guy to guard because he had all that shake and bake stuff. And that was kind of new for Australia back in those you know, this, you're talking 1979, and and he came in with you know razzle dazzle, uh, uh, but could back it up. It's a one particular play about Cal that I do remember that Cal got the ball in just a beeline. You know, it's like a it was like a dribbling drill to him. He ran past all five of us for a layup, and <laughs> that's when we realized, oh no, <laughs> this guy can play. Geelong had came and scouted me during the course of the season. We were trying to get into the National Basketball League, and they wanted to draw a card, and they thought I could be that guy. In 1982, we got included in the National Basketball League, which was great. Of course, it was a tough season. Um, three games into the season, they sacked uh, the coach, uh, Tim Kaiser, and then they asked me to step in. He's the first guy I had the speed, where that could shoot, could dribble, excellent passer, you know, a great competitor, and he combined that, that same thing as being a coach, and he was, I guess, strategic planner to try to make sure he knew what he wanted to try to achieve. Keep that guy holding the ball. He needs an option. So clear out. Screen away and bring them to whether it's diagonal, down or across. Okay. Bruton came out and just changed the game. You know, people would flock to see Bruton. He was something that we hadn't seen. His scoring, his speed, his style of play. You know, you didn't have to rely on a screen to get open, and Cal would just punish you. You know, it's nothing worse than being taller than a player by several inches, and, and he's dictating to you <laughs> what's going on. So we finished that season. I think it was 20 and six or something, and um, and went on to. To the semifinals, we had to play another Wilding, and we beat them, and then we go see West Adelaide in the championship. Uh, Al Green, Leroy Loggins, Ken Richardson, you know, Peter Ally, Ray Wood, and they went on to beat us by six in 80-74. And uh, Al, after we came out, he gave me the hug. That's where the hug started. Hey, you win, you hug, huh? He looks like... He's from New York, from Queens, New York, right? <laughs> I felt he kept going under me. Because Cal, you know, he's small, and I'm jumping kind of high in those days, and, and he's trying his best to play good defense, so he went under me. I said, yo, man, you're going to be one more time. I'm going to punch you in your... And he goes, yo, man, who you think I... I ain't no punk, man. You know, I'm from New York, too. I go, yeah, where? And he said, Queens. I said, yeah, right. That ain't New York. <laughs> and in 1984, I really thought we had the best team ever. There's James Crawford, there's Wayne McDaniels, there's Brad Dalton, there's Danny Marsu. Ah, the Black Pearl. Wasn't he a character? Look, I think the one thing Cal brought to our game, once again, there was a flashiness about Cal. He, he could score, he was explosive, he had terrific charisma. A and I think a lot of people look at basketball and say it's a big man's game. You know, Cal was not a big player. We lost to Leroy Loggins and them in the semis after losing to Canberra. And that knocked us out. And of course, Cameron went on to play uh, Brisbane in the, in the finals. And that was probably my most disappointing loss in Geelong. And it also finished my career there as well, because at that point, all the talk came out about captain coaches can't win championships. Packed the bags, called a big truck. As soon as the truck pulled up, the pack house stuff, here comes the owners <laughs> coming to the house. 
oh, Cal, you don't have to do this. Uh, here, we'll, we'll pay you all your back pay, this, that, and the other. Uh, nah, too late. You know, we, we're going now. And we left. And um, big challenge up in Brisbane. I think Cal brought some leadership to the club that we probably were, were lacking in our early stages of trying to build a championship team. And he kind of took us to another level individually because back in those days, the administration used to control a lot of what the players were doing. But when Cal came, he said, hey, I'm Cal. This is what I do. Y'all can like me or hate me. And that's when I thought, hey, I like this guy. Uh, we went on to, uh, to come from, uh, from nowhere early in the season while we were adjusting and injuries. And then we went on to finish up in the finals. And who do I see? <laughs> Me and Al Green again. <laughs> but this time, Leroy was on my team. <laughs> so, so I felt we was in the driver's seat a little bit. And we went on and uh, we won that championship, which was so much pressure off me. So finally winning the championship, I felt consolidated. You know, that, yes, I am a winner. It's all over. Brisbane have won the final. And we said to each other, listen, no matter what happens after a game, after the game or the grand final, because we knew we were going to be there again, we have to come up and hug each other, right? Give a kiss, uh, not on the lips. <laughs> Get that straight, not on the lips. And we like, on the cheek, cheek, I love you. I was so excited. And of course, we partied for days, and then, bang, it was off to represent Australia at that point. So everything just kind of steamrolled for there. So it, was, it turned out to be a great move for me personally. Um, to actually make that move to Brisbane. A true guy that would come on the court and, and bring that street sense, man. You know, he would throw the ball behind his neck and, you know, through the legs, whoopy whoopy doopy doopy, and here you go on the hot plate. That, that's the type of guy Cal was, and he always had that smile and that flair. And, and that's summing Cal up, man, because I won a championship with him, too. You know, Cal was a, a I don't take no kind of stuff type of player, you know, um, a very good shooter, but he was very, very smart at the same time. I thought Cal's strength was that being able to uh, manipulate players and maneuver players in a way that he felt that he can really expose them. They were a very potent team, that Brisbane team. When you look at their personnel on paper, you think, well, this was an awesome side. And then you look at the Adelaide team on paper, and you think, well, so is this. And it was really, that was the peak of their rivalry, that 86. The first game we lost at home by point, and we had to go to Adelaide, and everyone said, well, this is their year now. You know, they had a great team and all that. And I wasn't so sure. I, I thought, nah, I can get on top of this group. So the second game, they brought me off the, you know, I still coming off the bench, and I came off the bench, and I think they were a little cocky and easy, and I came off and scored 38 off the bench in that final, and we won. But let's see if Brisbane come back again as they've done all year. Bruton. Gee, isn't he a fine player? Bruton not finished with. Nice drive, Cal Bruton. He really has never, ever given up in this game. Anyway, they went on to win. It was my turn to come give him a hug, you know. And afterward, boy, Curl was furious, you know. He reckoned that I turned into a personal thing with Al and I took away from the team philosophy and all that. So I was equally livid. Like, how could you point it at me? And I was pumped. And then that next day, um, we heard the news about the Perth Wildcats being taken over by a new owner, Bob Williams. Bob Williams was known in Perth for his construction and his yachting activities. He got involved in basketball simply because he went down to the game one night, liked what he saw and bought the team. Bob Williams finally rang me and said, um, you know, we've done some research and uh, we think you'll be the best guy for our program. <sighs> Yeah, I was like, that was probably one of the highlights of my life right then. He bought a checkbook, he was able to sign up some people, and the very first thing he did was sign Cal. And uh, with Cal comes a, a whole lot of charisma, and, uh, mate, you know, if there was ever a salesman, he, he is it. His charisma and, and the way he uh, got himself across to the media and got everyone on side was, was fantastic, you know, and... Uh, he just brought us to a whole new level. I admire Cal in different ways, so uh, coming back playing that style of game, I know it's going to be my style because Cal liked to do the same thing that I do. He liked to run, you know, he liked to stun and have a little fun, so we was all about that. So we, we have a good laugh together, and, and I know he likes to win, so one thing about Cal, and get down to the, to the end, he, he, he will go to war with the guy you want on your side. This loud, brash guy called Cal Bruton arrives in town, an absolute journalist's dream. 
and he did a fantastic job making the public conscious of basketball and he assembled a very good side. 87 was definitely the start of a new era because we got players, we got sponsorship and we also got some television and some media coverage. And 87 we're going, you know, hey, we're a chance for the playoffs here, this is fantastic. And as it all panned out, we made the playoffs and so, you know, uncharted territory, we don't know what's going on here. We finished in fifth. It all took off in the semi-finals. They lost the first, scraped through in the second and uh, won the third on the Sunday fairly convincingly. They came back to Perth Airport on the Sunday night to scenes of Beatlemania. Thousands of fans went out to the airport and uh, they were mobbed. They, they pretty much had to close down the airport terminal because it was scenes of mass hysteria really. Uh, they had people sleeping out for tickets for the grand final because the stadium if it was three times as big, they would have sold it out. And we lost to Brisbane by one point in Perth in the best of three first game. And that just shattered. The lights went out and the game got stalled for a while. But it was a fantastic experience to go through that. When we went to Brisbane, they blew us out there. And then they popped the champagne and sprayed it all over us while they were celebrating. And I never forget telling our fellows, because everyone said, let's go in the locker room. I said, no, 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 we have to watch this because it's gonna be our turn one day. So stick your tongue out and get a little taste of the champagne because we'll get our shot. Cal Bruton and Brian Curl were the best of enemies. Um, a lot of history between them, but they both knew how to play the media. They both knew how to manipulate the media to get the public interested and they did that to the max. Cal came in, you know, he'd probably try and tell you he's a six footer, but he's probably about 5'9", five, 5'10", five, and he was a terrific player. And he made players around him play better. He played with an excitement. Suddenly there were all these kids running around that wanted to be like Cal Bruton. Wildcats, I thought, like really set the trend. And Bob Williams and Kerry Stokes came in, you know, sort of a, a year later, really took it to the next level, you know, in, in professionalism. At the end of that year, the owners came to me and said, uh, well, yeah, why don't you make a decision, whether you want to play or coach? Uh, I went to the owners with a proposition that I like to look at the next phase of my career in terms of becoming a general manager. And uh, I like to learn under Kerry and Bob, who obviously asked two businessmen, um, to assist me in that role. And would they consider me being a player and just being a general manager and I'll go out and hire a new coach? So they said, yeah, that sounds good. <laughs> it's never been done before in basketball. Alan Black's name came up. So we brought him in as head coach. But then we got to the finals and we played North Melbourne Giants and we get smacked by 55 points. Cal Bruton at that point decided that, well, that's probably fairly significant because he played in number 55 and he said, if ever there was a sign for me to retire, that's it. So I decided right then, I didn't tell anybody that I was going to retire from playing and just take up my full-time role as general manager. There was a, a lot of friction, obviously, between Cal Bruton and Alan Black at the time that very first road trip of the 1990 season, the team went down to Geelong, um, a superstar liner fell across the line, went up to Melbourne the next night, played Westside Melbourne Saints who were the easy beats of the competition and got beaten. Um, Cal and Alan were engaged in a fairly serious discussion for four hours on the plane flight back to Perth. Two days later the owners fired Alan and declared Cal would take over as coach. 1990, we'd put together a team that could really go all the way. We had no doubt in our mind that we could do that. We had that deep desire to succeed and to win. And we had decided at that point that, you know, this getting close is no good. We're not going to get close anymore. We're going for it. And then we're playing Brisbane, who's the team that beat us in 87. And we're back again, home court advantage with them. There's also been a fair amount of rivalry between Brian Curl and, and Cal Bruton over the years. You know, and to me, that is what built the excitement in that series. Very interesting grand final again. Wildcats dominated in Perth, went up to Brisbane for game two, which was an absolute catastrophe from the Wildcats' point of view. Kerry was living when we lost the, the second final to the Bullets. He said, everyone, hold up your hand. Everybody in the room, he said, I want you to slap your face. Pow! Again! Pow! Again! Pow! And my assistant coach at the time knocked the filling out of his mouth. He slaps himself so hard. And he carries says, how did that feel? 
well, that's what's going to happen to you if we lose in the grand final. That transition from going from player general manager to just general manager coach to winning the whole thing and being on top of the, the Australian Basketball League at that point was just uh, the greatest of, I thought, achievements. Particularly having turned that program around from 86 to going through what we had to go through to getting to 1990 and, and getting that, that, that big ring. Um, the crowd, the town, the, it was the first national championship for West Australia. There wasn't a lot of celebrating after Grand Final 3 uh, in the stadium. Um, they got their, their presents, rushed off the court, showered, got changed. They had a bus waiting at the airport so they could make the flight home. In the panic, uh, the one thing they forgot in the change room was the trophy. And um, on my way out to the bus, I ducked, I ducked into the change room to try to grab something to drink. Because I'd, I'd been working flat out making my deadlines and uh, went into the change room, which was in a state of absolute chaos. And <laughs> no one in there but the trophy. So I grabbed and went on the bus and said, better, better bring this along. When we got to uh, the plane that they, uh, they said to carry that, you know, it's too big, we have to put that underneath. I said, no, it's coming with us, we're to buy a seat for it, you know what I mean? So we brought the, the, the trophy on the, on the plane with us back to Perth. We arrived at the airport to about six or 7,000 people at Perth Airport at midnight on a Sunday night with a school day the next day you couldn't move, no one could get in there. So we actually had to come uh, or off the plane, get on a bus and they took us around the back of the tarmac and they'd set a stage up for us and we arrived and got up there. It was like celebrations upon celebration, but now it's time to look forward to the next year. I had Bob and Kerry come in and talk to me about the next year contract. Uh, I wanted to coach. They thought it was perfect timing for me to go back and become general manager. People asked Cal what he'd be doing the next year, and he said, I want to coach this team. I've now got something to enable me to play hardball with Kerry Stokes. Um, no, nah, <laughs> you don't play hardball with Kerry Stokes. Um, I think a, a, a deal had been done before that to get rid of Cal. I did it for four months, and then finally Hobart, uh, Wayne Monaghan, uh, and Dave Atkins, who was in America at the time, was contacted. Uh, he contacted me and said, you know, what you're doing there, they just go ice you down. You, you need to get involved in the league. There's a challenge for you down in Hobart. The Wildcats um, have accepted my resignation as general manager of the Perth Wildcats uh, so that I can accept a position of coach with the Cascade Hobart Tassie Devils. I'll never forget my first I left the entertainment center where I had a secretary, a receptionist, had my own office, stadium, everything. I go down to Hobart, get off the plane, they take me to the office, a little old house <laughs> with a little heat underneath the desk in the bedroom. <laughs> First bedroom on the left is your office. <laughs> the bedroom on the right was the general manager's. The kitchen was like a storage area for all the basketball and stuff. I'm going, God, Cal, what did you get yourself into here, you know? From the penthouse to the outhouse and one bold stroke, you know? <laughs> And I had a different attitude. I thought, gee, I could have this like Vegas, you know. This could be a program like in Vegas on the water. And, uh, but we couldn't get the good wins on the board. Three, fours, and fives, defensively, okay? Toughen up in the paint, baby. Don't let them get down there and stop any position. Work them, okay? People in Hobart, they love their basketball, so I thought they'd get great support. But it's just unfortunate that the crowds just wasn't big enough and couldn't get the kind of corporate support he really needed, but uh, he had the, the proper uh, idea. After we sort of hit the wall in 93 financially and then the players had to take pay cuts and so on and so forth, um, I resigned with the view of, okay, maybe I can get behind the program and get somebody from Perth who I knew would be interested in supporting me down in Hobart, maybe buying a part of the license. But um, it was just always going to be a tough call trying to get in on that side of the business. And uh, it seemed easier to pack up the bags. 99 of Boxing Day, I rocked up here in Canberra to take over their program. Uh, they were sitting on the bottom of the league uh, at that point. Uh, well, only a one win, I think. And, and basically, we missed out on one game from the playoffs. He kind of knew when to take a bunch of guys. And he was getting great talent, because at the end of 
end of his coaching career, he had some awesome players down the camera, man. As soon as the last game was over, we got to notice that we in voluntary administration. You know, the, the program here was sitting at a point where, okay, we went through the hard yards. I basically invested a lot of my own money back in it. You know, going out recruiting players, holding trial camps, getting a team here that was finally worthy of, of uh, being a top four, top 16 playoff team for sure, only to have everything come crumbling down again. I think now that the, the National Basketball League has been going this amount of time, it's important that we don't lose who the heroes were in the early days, especially, in, and I think the Hall of Fame establishment was an excellent idea because we do want to recognise the people who have contributed to this, this sport's fantastic growth and development. You can't deny the progress from those tin shed stadiums into these fantastic venues that, that uh, the teams are playing out of now. And you've got to recognise who were the players that did that? Who were the players that were responsible for this game's growth like that? You would pay to see Cal Bruton at his, at his peak. Pound for pound, Cal, I'll say to the day, was the best player ever to play. If that boy would let loose like he was capable of doing, he would have taught us because he had a heart like a, he had a heart as a giant. So little, but had a big heart.